Almost got me. It almost legitimately got me. You know, you know how once a week, traditionally, I will try and do like a bunch of things all at once and almost get caught, almost get caught with that still up on the screen by the time that uh, uh, the music's over and you're trying to start a show. Almost got me. But then it was like, okay, how many seconds uh, morning, Kepsi? Thank you, as always. Uh, you know, how many seconds left do I have in the intro? How many seconds left do I have to try and adjust things and flip things around? I just made it. I wasn't done, but I just reminded myself to go back and do it in time and get everything squared away because, and this may, this may as well be opening kickoff at this point, uh, brought to us by our friends at uh, kickoff coffee. And as I cover up the QR code for hour number two, uh, as you kick off your day, see what I did there. Uh, kick off your day with our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. And that's your QR code for those of you who are watching on Facebook, on Twitch, and on the 280 character app. And uh, Bam with our with our uh, Asian qualifier uh, notes this morning. And uh, Bam, I do have a question for you. So let me know how long you're here this morning. And it might be today, might be tomorrow. Uh, might be something that you put your thinking cap on about. Uh, so that's your QR code for our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Don't forget, thanks to everybody who has kicked off their day. See what I did there with our friends at Kickoff Coffee. And uh, they, in turn, if you use the code Sucker Down Here 15, they give you 15% off your purchase. Thanks to everybody who has used the code so far. And then they, in turn, take 10% reinvested into the youth game youth initiatives that uh, they have earmarked as cool. Once again, that is uh, 10% to, th to those efforts for uh, using the code SUCKER down here, 15, where we get 15% off there. So the friends, that's our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. I'm going to take my hand down. You'll have two QR codes up there with uh, what's going on. And that is uh, what's up. Uh, all right. So BAM with early updates. Myanmar 5-1 over Macau. And the Maldives and Bangladesh a 1-1 draw. And I know that uh, Bam was rooting for uh, the Maldives at an away game with the Maldives. So uh, very, very cool. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, if, uh, maybe if the Maldives get it to work, then, then Bam gets his away game in the Maldives in the group stage. That'd be very, very cool. But um, there was a question that I saw. And it was it was an interesting one. And so, Bam, put your thinking cap on with this and let me know what you think about this idea. And like I said, we know, you don't have to answer it quite yet, but it is probably something that uh, could be interesting. It's an article that came out with our friends at The Guardian. And I will post for today's required requested reading the link. Anj Pastakoglu was asked about the Matilda's World Cup legacy. And he says the following. So, of course, this is what happens when you lay everything out and you know, passwords and passcodes. That's the other part. When, you're, when your computer restarts. One day out from the start of the A-League women's season, Anj Postacoglu has delivered a sobering message to Australian football supporters, arguing that the Matilda success won't bring any long-lasting benefit or investment for the local game. The former Brisbane Roar and Socceroos coach now manages Spurs. He says, when you look at what the Matildas did at the World Cup, unbelievable, but you still won't see an influx of resources to the game. You won't, I guarantee it. Finished fourth at their home Women's World Cup this year. Semi-final defeat. Most watched program on Australian television, sport or otherwise. Pastacoglu said, quote, I just don't think the nation as a whole has that inside them to understand you can make an impact on the world of football, but it requires a kind of nationalistic approach 
that I just don't think Australians at their core are really interested in. So that's your that's your question. That that's your that's your question. So uh, that that that's that's Bam's question. Bam says a hundred percent correct. Morning, Alex. Soccer so far behind the AFL and the National Rugby League in terms of funding. So uh, that's part of what I wanted to get into this morning. Uh, today is the beginning of the international window, and it is where we look at we kind of chase after everybody and sit there and go, okay, what are we watching? What are we staring at? What's it important with? And so we'll go over all of, of that as well. And this was the the other thing that I was battling before I came on the air this morning. My computer restarted. And so I'm having to reopen all of those windows and all of those websites that are there traditionally that I had set up for the show this morning. And so literally as we go and I see a story that we're ch- we were chasing, it's like, oh, crap, I've got to open up another window. So that's where we are. Uh, got some action this morning in a little bit after opening kickoff. We'll go over the international roster of the day and let you know where things are. So what you can watch, where you can watch it, who's playing and who's doing what. So we'll get into all that. Nico Moreno set to join us at 1030. Traditionally, as he always does for Thursdays with Nico, talk a little Conma ball, talk a little Major League Soccer, talk whatever's on his mind as we go forward this morning. But uh, opening kickoff outside of uh, maybe how you guys chase after spider bites because apparently the spiders enjoyed me and i've been chasing after it with neosporin for the last four days neosporin that actually works that has an expiration date that isn't like four years ago actually went out and bought more so uh uh morning nicks good to see you uh the the coaching carousel and we talked about it we might talk about it with nico too we, we talked about coaching carousel a lot talked about it with dylan yesterday we talked about it with Jarrett and with Nick and with anybody that comes in to discuss what's what's on your mind when it comes to Major League Soccer because of the departure of Wayne Rooney to Birmingham after and it's still the weirdest thing to sit there and look at it where you look at the standings in Major League Soccer and you're going you know DC United the season's over they're at 40 points, and they've got an E. They've got an E already attached to their name. I mean, what, what's that got to be like? You know, you're like, if you're if you're a player in D.C. or if you're a fan of D.C. United, your season's over, and right now in the standings, you're in the nine spot in the east, but it doesn't matter what you do. Everybody else around you can jump you, and your season is done. Questions for D.C. obviously are, are a part of this on the field. Does Christian Benteke stay now that the guy that brought him over is back in England? Did Christian Benteke use this as a springboard to sit there and say, hey, you know, I can still compete. You know, you wave your hands in the air like someone who does care. And, you know, Ravel Morrison, we know that Wayne Rooney wanted to bring a bunch of other players over to try to get them some reps but couldn't and was frustrated because of the transfer rules. Tell me if you've ever heard that before. Transfer rules, salary rules, all that kind of stuff. But now that Wayne Rooney is back in England, and I can never do, I can never do it like Jason does when, when we're discussing this particular country. But the question that I have, it, it, was, it was an interesting question that came across And it probably is something that you can go, well, you know, that's interesting. I'd like to bring in so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so, so, well, that's not a good start. That's definitely not a good start with the X this morning, where I'm sitting here going, you know, I'd like to actually see what's on the X. But, oh, they want me to sign back in. You know, this is just... when your computer restarts and you're sitting there going, yikes. All right. But anyway, you're looking at coaching vacancies. And it was an interesting, it was an interesting name that came across 
in the news yesterday. And I admit that I'm going to be using uh, the, the Daily Mirror for this particular story because it was the first one that I could plug into uh, after having to restart my computer. Former Manchester United boss Ole Gunnar Solskjaer jetted into the U.S. This is Tom Beatty's words from the Daily Mirror. Ahead of, uh, ahead of a trip to D.C. United's training base as Wayne Rooney's contract standoff continued to rumble, rumble on. This was eight days ago. Out of work since his sacking at Old Trafford in November 2021. And he was uh, getting ready for the D.C. It was in time for the D.C. Austin match. They spent time together, obviously. Rooney signed with, from Everton in 04. Solskjaer uh, was, uh, would win the Premier League with him in 2007 before retiring. It is understood that the former United manager's arrival in America was expected with the trip having been arranged previously. In a previous conversation with The Athletic, the former Manchester United manager confirmed he would be traveling to the East Coast of the United States. Revealed he'd be making the trip to see former club teammates uh, Wayne Rooney, David Beckham, potentially catching some matches. DC currently was in this. Like I said, this was when he first showed up. And so... Solskjaer may be able to empathize with Rooney, who's facing some uncertainty over his post as his contract runs down. Like I said, this was before Rooney decided to go to Birmingham City. According to The Athletic, Solskjaer did not arrive at the team's training base in Leesburg, Virginia, to talk about potentially taking over from his ex-teammate. In fact, the report contends that the former Mulder boss is not a candidate to replace Rooney or take the vacant GM vacancy post at the club. Rooney's previously spoken at length of his frustration surrounding the uncertainty hanging over his future. Once again, we got into all that. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, as a part of the discussion at D.C. and Charlotte, if you could pull the trigger on something like this, well, first off, if you were Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, would you be interested in the Charlotte gig or the D.C. gig? Tommy Scoops at the time when uh, Solskjaer came across to this side of the pond, one source said that he isn't a head coach or GM candidate. But if you had the chance, if you, if you had the chance, would you bring in somebody like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to be in Major League Soccer if he was interested in doing something like that? If you could pull the trigger and give him control, would you, would you, could you bring in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as a manager in Major League Soccer? I mean, obviously, first he'd have to be interested, but if you could pull the trigger, would you do it? Knicks would do it. And it was interesting. Well, first and foremost, for me, it would be D.C. over Charlotte, considering everything that is wrong with Charlotte right now. All the front office turmoil. All, you, had a, uh, you had a training facility, then you stopped construction on it. All of that, all of that stuff that's going on in Charlotte, I probably would choose D.C. over Charlotte. But the thing is, is that you'd have to have creative control. and Or you would have to be with someone who is of a like mind to try and sit there and go, well, you know, Oli, I think we're right on the same path. You and I, you know, we're like this. We are of the same like mind. And frankly, that's what I would be looking at. If I was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, without question, I would sit there and go, okay, you know, I like the gig. Yeah, it was a different, yeah, Alex, they did. It was a different training facility. It was the 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 one that they were building in South Carolina for like 11 gazillion dollars. And then they stopped construction on it. And then they just decided to build this one for 30 that they just opened. Remember, it's like, so this, the, the one that's currently now open is like take two is the question, is is the, the thought. It's like they had that big one there that was going to be in Rock Hill, and then they stopped construction on it. And then they built the short one. Then they built the new one, which they dropped $30 million on as opposed to $11 billion on the other one. 
And so they've opened this new one as opposed to that large one that they stopped construction on on the other side of the, the South Carolina line. But I thought it was interesting that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was checking out stuff in Miami, checking out stuff in uh, D.C., and then he was linked to the Charlotte gig, which isn't open. And frankly, as we've talked, if Charlotte wins and gets into the playoffs, I think that uh, Christian Latanzio is safe. But if you look at D.C., the question would be, if you're Jason Levy and in that group, would you try to break the bank to bring Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in to be your new head coach? But the key would have to be control. And an understanding that there are some things you can do and some things you can't unless you follow the Messi and Friends model when it comes to all of your personnel decisions. So it was uh, it was just an interesting thing for me to see uh, OGS on this side of the Atlantic. And then that starts things, you know, twirling in your head and you're going, you know, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe that's, a, you know, that's an interesting thought. But would you invest enough to satisfy him or at least tell uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, hey, look, we're going to invest. We're going to do this, 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 and this. Are you in? Just a name to kind of file to the side with coaching carousel being what it is. And like I said, we'll catch up with Nico Moreno in a little over an hour and get his thoughts on coaching carousel and all of that stuff. But yeah, that was that's more opening kickoff than anything else. Just seeing Ole on this side of the Atlantic kind of, kind of piques your interest a little bit. So it was a very, very interesting idea. Just a thought. That's your opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Covering up our number two's QR code for the sake of our number one. Hang on. There we go. That's your QR code. For those of you who are watching on Twitch here in our number one for Kickoff Coffee, thanks to everybody who's kicked off their day using Kickoff Coffee. You like what I did there? And once again, use the code soccer down here 15 to get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game and youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. One QR code away. That's QR code for our number two. So I'm getting the hang of it. I'm getting the hang of things. So today is like the beginning of the international window. U23s for the U.S. They had a, they had a good night last night. They won 2-1. Uh, Bayrak Terevich and Obed Vargas getting the goals. Had a 2-0 lead and ended up winning 2-1. And what I wanted to do early on in the day, uh, no, they, uh, Hutch asking, do coach salaries count in the MLS maze of compensation rules? And Nick says that you can spend what you want pretty much on back office staff facilities. You can do all that stuff all, all you want. So, uh, yeah, if you want to, if you wanted to pay a coach $9 billion a year, which I imagine is what CFG is going to do when Pep Guardiola wants to have his condo at Central Park West overlooking the city and coaching at NYC, they're going to, they're going to pay him a lot. But for City Football Group, it's just like, yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll take it from here and take it over here. Anything that has that has nothing to do, anything that has nothing to do, how's that for a, a crossover negative? Uh, anything off the field. You can invest what you want off the field. But the on-the-field stuff still has the rules that need to be adjusted, the players that need to be adjusted, the cap that needs to be adjusted, all those things. Still think you got to have a ceiling. Still think you got to have a floor. Still think you need to have uh, more than just the the three DPS. There's still a lot of things that need to be changed. A lot need to be changed. So there's plenty of all of that discussion to be had. But the key is, if you want to bring in somebody. Uh, okay, so Bam says uh, I'm supposed to send him 
a DM on the 280 character app with a pic, with a picture on why Anja's comments are true to the Soccer Down Here 280 character app. You want me to multitask? I'm trying to I'm trying to do a show here, man. I'm trying to do multitask. Oh, you sent. Okay. I saw I saw the uh I saw the DM pop up on my phone. Uh I may uh, I may grab it at some point, but I just wanted to get your feedback on it as a part of a larger conversation. Uh we will get to it, but it was a topic that I had in mind this morning. All right. So, international play. There's a lot of it. And uh by the way, uh that is not what I wanted to do soccer america see i'm still i'm still fighting from behind here uh all right so we're going to start with soccer on tv and go with uh, what's what we're staring at here acc network's got women's soccer today fs2 is saba watch georgia and thailand at noon so we'll see if uh, saba plays at noon on fs2 Euro 2024 qualifying. We'll get into all of that grid and tell you where things are coming up in just a little bit. Croatia, Turkey, 245. SEC, Florida, and Arkansas on the women's side at 7. Conmebol tonight. Like I said, we'll get into this with Nico Moreno as well. Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, Venezuela. 8 and 8.30 on Universo. B1G's got five matches on the women's side. ESPN Plus has seven matches on the men's side and like 20 billion of them on the women's side. Fanatis, and it's pay-per-view, sadly. Colombia, Uruguay at 4.30. Chile, Peru at 8. If you're looking for other things on Fanatis, fntz.co slash soccer down here gets you uh, what you're looking for with Teise, with For the Fans, with CDO, with Gold TV, with BN, with uh, Copa Libertadores, all of that. The Brasileiro, Fanatis. Jason got me hooked. I blame him. So our friends at Fanatis, on the pay-per-view side, it's an additional cost. Colombia, Uruguay at 4.30, Chile, Peru at 8. FIFA Plus has Bolivia and Ecuador at 7. Flow has nine college women matches starting on the East Coast at 3 o'clock. Fox Soccer Plus, Latvia, Armenia at noon, Albania, Czech Republic at 2.45. Fubo, five matches at 2.45. Spain, Scotland, Cyprus, Norway, the Faroe Islands. Our buddies from the Faroe Islands are hosting Poland at 245. Andorra, will they score against Kosovo? Belarus and Romania at 245. Knicks, good to see you. Glad you could drop by. Paramount Plus, CONCACAF Nations League qualifying starts at 3 o'clock. St. Martin, not St. Martin, but St. Martin with the two A's. St. Kitts and Nevis at 3. St. Lucia, Guadalupe at 5. Suriname, Haiti at 6. Derek Etienne Jr. is available, I believe, for Haiti in that one. Bonaire, Anguilla at 7. Grenada, Jamaica at 7. Dominica in the British Virgin Islands at 8. Cuba, Honduras at 9. VIX has Georgia, uh, Thailand, Sweden, Moldova. The eight matches we were talking about on Euro 2024 qualifying, and then the two matches in Conmebol, Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, and Venezuela. So very, very busy day when it comes to uh, – Europe and the European qualifiers. So looking at what is up in this in this go round, once again, who qualifies in the Euro? Two teams qualify from each of the 10 groups. Three teams then qualify via the playoffs contested by 12 teams selected on the basis of their performance in Nations League. Germany is host the only country currently certain to be one of the 24. Standings is probably something that we should get into as we as we get into uh, all of this stuff just to get you squared away for the day. And we'll get into juice boxes as well. And, and since there's uh, eight matches, I'll try to do it quick. Yeah, bam, use a VPN. Make it as you're in Australia and you can watch the games for free on the Comma Ball YouTube. There you go. A little helpful hint from Bam this morning, this evening for him. Armenia to minus 110 favorite at noon over Latvia. Czech Republic at a plus 137 favorite against Albania. Kosovo big favorite at Andorra at a minus 222. Romania to minus 175 at Belarus, who's a plus 550. Croatia at home at a minus 152. 
Turkey on the road is a plus 459 in the composite. Cyprus is a plus 1645 as they wait for Norway at a minus 625. The Faroe Islands, actually, they're not a plus 1,000 at home. They're at a plus 886. Poland, a minus 278 on the road. Spain and Scotland. Spain, it's probably your match of the day at 245. We know that Jared will be gassed up for that one. Spain's a minus 333. Scotland, a plus 950. Standings, and we have today and tomorrow when it comes to qualification. And the the in the palace intrigue that is attached to all of it. Scotland right now, they're five for five. Fifteen points leading group A. It would be Scotland and Spain, but Spain's only two points ahead of Norway. Georgia's got some work to do at four points. They have the three in a row that they've lost since starting out in the group with a draw and a win. France and the Netherlands, 15 points, 9 points, but Group B, Netherlands and Greece are right there with each other. Netherlands with a match in hand. Group C, England, 6 points ahead of Italy, Ukraine, and North Macedonia. What do you think? There'll be some shenanigans heading into that one. Italy, match in hand. Ukraine, Macedonia, they played 5. 3 teams, 7 points. Goal difference, Italy's on top. Group D. Bam, good luck with the job interview, my friend. Group D, Croatia and Turkey, three points ahead of Armenia and Wales. Wales with some work to do. Playing Croatia in three days' time. Group E, Albania, Czech Republic, 10 points, 8 points. Moldova behind on goal difference. Poland at six points after the first five matches. Czech Republic with a match in hand. Group F, Belgium and Austria running the table so far. They are far and away the best in the group ahead of Sweden, Azerbaijan, and Estonia. Group G, Hungary, Serbia ahead of Montenegro by only two points. Hungary's got a match in hand. Group H has six teams. Slovenia, Denmark, Finland, Kazakhstan. It's chaos. Slovenia, Denmark, each with 13 points. Each with a goal difference of seven. Slovenia has scored one more goal. Finland and Kazakhstan. Finland has scored 11 goals. Kazakhstan has scored nine with 12 points. And then Northern Ireland and San Marino. San Marino has yet to score in their six matches. They've given up 21. Group I has six teams. Switzerland, Romania, 1-2. Israel right now is third with 11 And the next match for Israel is slated for November 15th. Obviously, we'll keep an eye on that. Group J, Portugal, Slovakia. Portugal's run the table. They have not given up a goal in group play. 24 scored, none allowed, 18 points. Five points ahead of Slovakia, who's three points ahead of Luxembourg. So that's where you are with your group play with with the, the Euros. And what you could anticipate today and tomorrow as a part of all of this. Scotland's win on match day two, according to our friends at Sky. Thoughts are now only about qualifying, but finishing top of the group. A win or a draw against Spain in Seville today will see Scotland book their place in Germany for next summer's tournament. Even if they lose, Norway have to win in Cyprus, but you would anticipate that that would happen. New from UEFA today, UEFA announces that the 2024 European qualifiers match between Kosovo and Israel scheduled for the 15th of October has been postponed as the Israeli authorities currently do not allow their national team to travel abroad. Not necessarily a surprise. News came out this morning, and that's from our friend uh, Rob Harris. If Spain and Norway win, Scotland fans have to wait until Sunday when the two play each other. Again, Norway's got to win the match to keep their hopes alive and stop the qualification party. Last time out, Scotland with Scott McTominay's early goal. Ryan Christie, Lyndon Dykes. McTominay again, early second half, got the second. Scotland's game management defended well. Frustrated Spain. Remember what Rodri said after the match. He didn't like the approach. Rodri forgets, <laughs> according to our friends at Sky, Rodri forgets that Scotland are not setting up for a game to suit Spain and give them easy passage. 
Scotland are playing to their strengths, and while we're at it, they played some great football, far from an ultra-defensive display or a smashing grab. Back in March, that was at Hampton Park. Luis De La Fuente had just taken over since then. They've won Nations League in June, scored 13 goals in two qualifying matches, just one conceded. Out to prove a point, targeting and expecting to win the group. Steve Clark is aware, but as Angus Gunn said at his media conference during the week, progress made, start we've had, does take the pressure off and away in Seville. Might just help Scotland try and get the point that, you, that they need. No Kieran Tierney, injured while on loan in Spain with Real Sociedad. Question is, does he go three to the back? Three or five at the back. Compliment Tierney and Andrew Robertson. Or does he go to the back four like he did against Poland? Got the nil-nil draw to get Nations League promotion. Two games in which Scotland lost with Tierney out in the back three deployed the Czech game in Euro 2020 and the World Cup playoff semi-defeat to Ukraine, both at Hampton Park. It didn't work. Seville's a city that, that promised so much, once again, from our friends at Sky. For Scottish teams in the past, Celtic lost out in the UEFA Cup final in extra time to Porto in 2003. Penalty shootout 17 months ago to Eintracht Frankfurt in the Europa League final. So maybe they just want to get in and get out of Seville. Scotland's fixtures once again, the 12th, they're at Spain. Then they're at France in a friendly on October 17th. Then they have, and then they're at Georgia, November 16th in a qualifier, and then they are home to Norway on the 19th. But having these opportunities for a team like Scotland, you know that Jarrett will be on the edge of his seat. Harry Kane says he wants to play at the Euro 2028. You figure he'll be able to. And what are you going to tell him? No. Are you going to, are you going to tell you going to tell Harry Kane no? The only thing that would tell Harry Kane no would be uh, Harry Kane's own body, I believe. But it will be interesting to see what happens with the Euro today. Get it locked in early. Make sure that uh, if you if you wish to take Bam's advice when you're looking about Conmebol, Maybe, like I said, I don't know this. There are those of you who are fairly well versed in this, better well versed than better well versed, more well versed, better versed than I when it comes to this kind of thing. You guys know how to do this better than I do. The whole VPN thing. The whole VPN thing is definitely something that I do not have a whole lot of experience with. I trust it works. I trust that you guys watch it. And so it's the fun part and getting all of the feedback from you guys about how you can navigate things and hopefully not uh, download uh, things you shouldn't, I guess, is probably the best way to phrase it. England play Australia in a friend, uh, friendly at Wembley on Friday. Wales won 4-0 against Gibraltar in a friendly. Uh, other news that is out there this morning. The next question is, for Calvin Phillips, who'd be interested? Everton, but would he want to go to Everton? My answer would be sadly no right now. Do you want to be in a relegation fight? I guess if you want to challenge yourself in a relegation fight, the answer would be yes. Is it time for him to go? That's the big question. In January, is it time for Calvin Phillips to go? Calvin Phillips said that he wanted to test himself, and he wanted to be tested at Manchester City. Started two Premier Leagues in 18 months. That's where he is right now. Does Calvin Phillips hang out? I would say that he probably tries to find a uh, tries to find a way to make sure that uh, he finds a home and gets some work. That to me is the biggest thing in all of this. Find some work, Calvin Phillips, 
or do you want to be part of an integral group that chases after a championship? Gossip rumor and innuendo this morning. Barca weighing up a move for Arsenal's uh, Jorginho. Harry Maguire threatened to, has threatened to leave Manchester United. Now, wait a minute. Okay. So Harry Maguire was so frustrated that he wanted, that he had his captaincy pulled, but he wanted to stay. And so now, two months into the season, but once again, this is from the four letter paper, so take the information at your own peril. Harry Maguire has threatened to leave Manchester United if he continues to struggle for regular first-team football under Eric Ten Hag. Once again, four-letter paper, take the information at your own peril. But didn't we just do this two months ago? I thought we just did this two months ago, but that's just me. Real Madrid have extended the contracts of Eduardo Camavinga and Federico Valverde until 2028. Both deals, including release clauses of a billion pounds. Seriously? I mean... How many folks, short of perhaps winning the lottery last night, and I did not, how many of you played, by the way, and how many of you went to small towns to get your ticket? $1.73 billion U.S. And I know we all have our plans as to what we would do if we won something that large. $1.73 billion and somebody in California won it. So if you'd won the lottery... And you took the cash option. You still would be $200 million short of activating a release clause for either Camavinga or Valverde. Allegedly. $200 million short. Bart says, I'm sorry to report that I will not be bringing an NWSL team to Atlanta. Much, almost a Jared level Kushner, a Jared Kushner level of payoff. Uh, no, I think I think that uh, it, if that is probably this is probably what I should have done yesterday. Is if you'd won, what would you be investing in? That that's 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 always a good question when you get to a jackpot that's that high. Uh, Jesse Lingard boosted his chances of a move to Al Ittifak after scoring for Steven Gerrard's side in a friendly yesterday. Been without a club since leaving Nottingham Forest this summer. Apparently, attendance figures in that league that we're really not covering for any aspect and I have no interest in watching. Short of a couple of clubs, the attendance is abysmal. And I think all uh, Etifak is one of them. I think that they had only like 800 folks show up at a game. And the, the, uh, the visuals of this particular stadium where you had 800 people show up, it was awesome. That is not meant to slight the individuals on the pitch at all. But you deserve what you get. Have zero interest in watching the league, zero interest in covering the league. But when I when there's uh, like 800 folks showing up at a match, very cool. Good work, league. Yes, and Hutch, that is absolutely correct. All right, well then, Bart, go ahead. You got a list? Go for it. Had you won, had you won, what would you have done? We'll, we'll, we'll play we'll play hindsight 2020. You got a list? What would you have done? $1.73 billion, probably 800 after taxes. If you take the cash option, what would you have done? I know what I would have done. There'd be a lot of investment. There'd be expanded programming. You take care of your friends, you take care of your family, and then you figure out where to go from here. 10%, you do whatever you want. And then take the rest, and you file it away, and then you do good causes and things like that. That's me. Um, Chelsea have added Napoli to Victor Osimhen uh, forward to their list of January targets. Who hasn't Chelsea put on their list of targets? Me? All of us? I think we're the only ones that Chelsea has not targeted for the January window. Bayer Leverkusen boss Shabi Alonso has a clause in his contract which would allow him to become manager of any of his former clubs. Liverpool, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich as early as next summer, according to our friends at Build. West Ham, Brighton, Crystal Palace, and Bournemouth interested in Stuttgart forward Serhu Girassi. 
leading goal scorer in the Bundesliga so far this season. Manchester United set to extend the contracts of Aaron Juan Bissaka and Victor Lindelof, but will take their time before deciding on Anthony Martial. When Nick is on the next time, I'm going to ask him about this particular thing. Antonio Conte has rejected the chance to become Napoli's next manager with him preferring to wait for opportunities elsewhere, according to Fabrizio Romano. Conte was linked. Sounded like he was tempted, but he's just kind of like, nah, at the end of the day. Napoli also have uh, Julian Lopetegui on their list of possible replacements for Rudy Garcia. Jose Mourinho is interested in signing Eric Dyer, whose contract at Spurs runs out in 2024. Juve keen on signing Pierre-Emil Hoybier in January. Inter Milan have their sights on West Ham midfielder Thomas Suchek. Belgian midfielder Yuri Tielemans wants to leave Aston Villa after a falling out with Unai Emery. That did not go well after leaving Leicester. Barcelona monitoring Porto's midfielder Alan Varela. Royal Antwerp midfielder Arthur Vermeeren. Bayer Leverkusen uh, and Germany's Florian Wirtz as they look to strengthen their midfield. Arsenal also interested in Vermeeren, who's only 18. Valued at around 15 million pounds. And uh, former PSG boss Christoph Galce is close to becoming the new manager at Qatari side Al De Hale. Once again, another league that I really don't care about. But once again, it's Fabrizio Romano and it's news. So we talk, we talk about it that, that, that much quickly, that, that much faster, and we get it in, we get it out. We're done. Uh, so yeah, that's, your, that's, your, uh, that's your news for the moment. No, Nick. Uh, Rooney was not that Birmingham team. It's Birmingham, Birmingham City. Cool, the Legion landed Rooney. Not quite. Uh, yeah, our friend Kaylor Hodges probably would have exploded if that happened. Uh, wildest thing ever: sitting dormant, sitting in the playoff spot with no way to qualify for the playoffs. Hutch says install the forever pinned extension in Chrome. I'll have to figure that out to find it. I have to find it. Uh, Four card says English managers can't hang in Major League Soccer can only win on a humid day in July. Can he win on a humid day in July? I don't know. It depends. It depends on the gig. Depends on the absolute gig that you're staring at. Uh, All right. So here's Bart's list. That's a big list. I have to tuck my chin in here or kind of go over the top of it. All right, so here's Bart's list. Had he won the uh, Mega Millions or uh, Powerball or whatever it was, I always get them confused. Uh, Bart would have a women's franchise. He would buy it and renovate Herndon Stadium, turn it into a, an apartment mixed-use development company. But remember, you've got the HBCU there to help out as well. You can help out the campus. Uh, Art Center and Midtown Stations, uh, WVU College of, thank you, Hutch, uh, Art Center Midtown Stations, WVU College of Media Grad School so- Scholarship, LRU Student Athlete Award and Scholarship, Locker Room Renovations, uh, LRU Soccer and Swimming, WVU Men's Soccer, and a brewery in St. Albans, West Virginia. I like how you think. Cena, what you do is then you tie the brewery and the beer to your soccer team. Put them on the cover. You know, put them on the front of the jersey. That's what you do. You cross over all that stuff. That would be that would be uh, interesting if you sit there. All about the cross promotion for eight hundred million dollars. Eight hundred million bucks. That's what you do. You work. You work your way all the way through. Um. All right, Bart. One of the things that I also had on my list this morning has to do with VAR audio. And it appears that according to the CEO of the FA, Mark Bullingham, that VAR audio could be made available live. Where have we heard that before? Where have we seen that before? Bullingham is the director at IFAB, (coughs) excuse me, which he says has discussed the topic. This is from our friends at uh, PA Media. And apparently there's a split between the marketing people and the referees. 
Sorry, something went down the wrong way. All right, so here's here's the here's the lay here's the lay of the land here. Mark Bullingham, the chief executive officer of the Football Association, has raised the prospect of the game's global rulemaking body examining whether audio between reps and VAR should be available live. I guess it's well, but I mean, in the Women's World Cup, and Bart, tell me if I'm wrong here. On the TV side, we got to have the conversation. We got, or I know that in the XFL and the USFL, we got to have the conversation. What was the conversation? Remind me on the TV side during Women's World Cup. I thought we had, we got to, we were privy to the, that audio. Maybe, like I said, I'm just mixing it up with the XFL and the USFL and conversations with Dean Blandino. But I thought we had the opportunity to listen to that conversation live. That's just, I'm trying to remember. Miscommunication that goes to the the whole Darren England thing with Liverpool and Spurs and all that. Broadcasting the conversations between on-field officials and VARs live is currently prohibited under football's laws. But Bullingham, who's a director at IFAB, which has the power to change the laws, said the organization had discussed the subject. Women's World Cup, they gave a decision announcement live after the VAR check. Thank you. Quoting Bullingham, generally there's a split in the room over that, and quite often it's between the marketing and commercial people and the referees. Our point of view from the marketing and commercial perspective would normally be that transparency is a really good thing and we want fans to have the maximum experience, end quote. Bullingham said, an ongoing FIFA trial where referees announce and explain the outcome of an on-field review is a step in the right direction, adding, quote, my personal point of view is I do think live audio will continue to be a question over time because the greater transparency shows how difficult the referee's job is, and it has worked in other sports. There is an understandable nervousness from others that the referee's job is hard enough as it is. In a tournament, you have referees with multiple languages, so it's not as straightforward as some might suggest. So I think we're taking a step in the right direction with announcing the decision and explaining why it has been reached. Let's see if that leads to further progression. IFAB, it's understood, is set to open up the trial of in-stadium announcements by referees beyond FIFA events to other interested competitions. The body may also look again at the wording of Principle 10 in the VAR protocol, which currently prevents VARs from revisiting a decision once play has restarted and meant the officials could not call play back after the Diaz error. But then what do you do? Do you reset the clock? Do you sit there? But then you've got to figure out, okay, how far back do we reset the clock? And then you go with restarting and all that kind of stuff, or do you just add minutes? You try to figure out, okay, how long did the how long did the discussion take? Add those minutes and go forward. Just add another three minutes to the end to go with uh, dissent and everything else. Dissent, time wasting, referees' decisions. That's where we are. It could be updated, principle ten, to allow a decision to be revisited where a clear mistake has occurred and where no significant action has taken place since play restarted. Bullingham also said he was aware IFAB had been asked to consider widening the scope of VAR to rule on decisions such as corner kick and free kick awards. Okay, now we're kind of pushing it here. I mean, if it's a card, I mean, literally, now you're starting to get into ticky-tack stuff if you're Bullingham, I think. VAR intervention is currently limited to goals, penalties, straight red, mistaken identity. Quoting Bullingham, I think we would be really reluctant to have a game that was stopped a lot more than it currently is, but that will be a proper discussion. Right now, goals, penalties, straight red, mistaken identity. If you widen it to corner kick and free kick, then you're really, you're really kind of, you're, you're really pushing the door here and you're getting into practically every aspect of what could go wrong and what could not go wrong then what's next do you sit there and do var do you have cyclops on the end line and the the touch line and the end line to sit there and say was the ball completely all the way out i mean you're getting to the point if you're bullying them here 
where literally every aspect of the game would be monitored and principle 10 would be widened so far under VAR protocols. And like, and I know that I'm taking it to an extreme here by saying all of this, but I think that if you widen it to corner kick and free kick, you're taking the, the ARs and you're taking the center F out of the discussion. Then if you go touch line in line, you're taking it up further away from the human element. More and more and more and more. And that's uh, that you're kind of sitting there. Nah. I don't know how far you should take this. I mean, you principle 10 right now. Uh, you're looking at if we look at it from the prism of the Liverpool Spurs incident. We're kind of sitting there going, okay, we know we messed up, but we got into it Bart with, with Bart yesterday, and that segment is up on the network. It has to do with communication, and that's the big thing here for me, communication. As the son of an English major, it's all about modifiers. You get your modifiers correct because if you remember the audio, if you remember the audio, this is what was going on as they were discussing it. This is what you were staring at. Here was what the conversation was in this incident. Let's go back and revisit it real quick. Being rolled up here to Luis Diaz. Poro has stayed with him. Diaz got a shot away and scored immaculately only to be rendered despondent by an upraised flag. Of course, that'll be checked. Yeah, well, it was a finish. It certainly was. I'm just going to have a look. I'll tell you what, he's oh, on side. He's on. he's on. This is going to count. Unless my eyes deceive me, the lines of the pitch where the groundsman's cut the grass, it's a brilliant finish because he's been wrestled. He is offside. Am I so, am it's, I, a, it's a deceptive angle. Am I, am I seeing things there? <laughs> it's being rolled up here to Luis Diaz, Poro State. Okay, so... That was the other part of this that I needed to fix. I need to fix the loop track. All right. So that was how it was described by Peter Drury. And God bless Peter Drury and, and, and Lee Dixon for, for trying to give the benefit of the doubt here. Here's the audio from VAR in that incident. Oh, good. Both holding. Both holding. Yeah. Leave it though. Waiting. Delaying. Delaying. Delay yes. Yeah. Give it. Coming back for the offside, Come mate. On. Just checking the offside, the other delay. Give me a kick point. Let's go. Yep. Kick point, yeah, please. No so, here we are. Wait, okay. Um, just get a tight angle. Yeah, give me 2D line ready, I feel, as well, for frame right, two so after that. Frame, That's fine. Frame two there. Perfect. I've got yep. the time on this. I clock 2D it, line so. on left boot. Yep. Well, let me Romero, just I, angles. I think it might be this angle better. Hey. Happy with okay. this angle? Yeah. You you yep. 2D line on the boot. 2D line on the boot. Yep. Okay. So 2D line on the boot. I'll, I'll check in. complete. Check complete. It's fine. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Off. Thank you, mate. Thank you, mate. Wait, wait, wait. wait. The on-field decision was offside. Are you are you happy with this? Yeah. Are you happy with this? Offside on field decision. Go. Yeah. That's, no, that's what it does. What? On-field decision was offside. Are you happy with this Never image? Yes, yeah, onside. The image we gave him is onside. Left back. He's played. He's yeah. gone offside. Delay, delay, delay. Dave, yeah. Ollie's saying to delay. Oh, Ollie's saying to oh, delay. Red throw, red throw, red throw. Pardon? Ollie's calling in to say delay the game. To, to complete. The yeah. decision is off. Cut your thing. Ollie's saying to delay. Ollie's saying to delay. Ollie? Yeah. yeah delay on. the game. To delay the game. Stop the yeah, game. They've restarted Nothing the game. The yeah, they've restarted. Yeah. Can't do anything. No. I can't do anything. I Stay can't back. do anything. Uh-huh. So that was the conversation that was had. That was the conversation. Check complete off. It's all about communication and all about modifiers in this situation. 
I don't think that you have to sit there and widen the scope of 10 to where you're you're navigating every single possible aspect and taking away human discussion in all of this. But it's about communication and it's about modifiers. Take your time to say your sentence. You could tell they were rushing to try to get the call correct. They wanted to try to get the game back moving. And in that rush to get the game back underway, they left modifiers on the table. And like I said, as the son of an English major, you're going, ah, you need your modifiers in that case. Mike McGrath, The Telegraph. Back to the Bullingham discussion. Back to more transparency. But it appears that refs are kind of pushing back on this from the beginning. Howard Webb, the head of the PGMOL, has previously spoken publicly about pushing for VAR audio to be aired live, meaning that any opposition would be from the outside England, likely with FIFA's referees committee headed up by former official Pierluigi Colina. Bollingham also said the FA have no issues surrounding the sudden influx of Saudi cash into the global game. Clubs in Saudi Pro, once again, broke 700 million pounds in spending, headlined by the moves for Neymar, Jordan Henderson, who, by the way, uh, told, oh, who was it? It was, uh, told folks at The Athletic that, uh, yeah, he was just getting paid to do straight soccer and not any PR. And then he cuts a PR, uh, he cuts a, he cut a promo about Saudi Arabia on his, uh, on his social media. It's at to Adam Crafton. Um, Fabinho, Firmino, Bullingham believes the Premier League will continue to lead the way on the global stage. Quote, the fact that Saudi are investing in the pro league, we don't have a problem with that. Any country can invest in their league. And I think many leagues have invested in football in the last 10 or 15 years to make themselves a primary league in the world are no different. What we have seen is some footballers going there in the latter stages of their career, but also some going in their prime. I have no doubt they'll build a good league over there. From our point of view, Still very confident that we have the best league in the world in the Premier League. Incredibly proud of that. Continue to support it. Doesn't mean we shy away from speaking about any other league. Same could be said about the Chinese uh, Super League, by the way. How'd that go for you? Didn't quite go well. Just saying. It is now past the top of the hour. Man, this is what happens. This is flying. Uh, Nico, joining us in about a half hour, by the way. Uh, and we'll go through Conma Ball. We'll go through Major League Soccer and all those other kinds of things with Nico coming up. Oh, later today, a uh, little traffic. Uh, did a great interview yesterday with Lena Saul in the community. Rela- she's the community relations coordinator with Atlanta United. And Marty Jellamy, the head coach of the Unified team, and got to have a, a bit of an education about the Unified team and what this season was like. Uh, Jason and uh, Joe Freihofer and myself uh, privileged to call those games either uh, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium or at Red Bull Arena in late June or in Dallas. And it was a great conversation that we had with Lena and with uh, Marty about the season, about the unified team, just to kind of get a bit of an education and how things have continued to grow with the unified team as, as we've gone. But it was a, a great look back at the 2023 unified season. So that'll be up early this afternoon on, on the network. And uh, for those of you remotely interested with one of the other me's, uh, I will be at Eventide Brewing later this afternoon in the 5 o'clock hour, hanging out with Peter Biello from uh, GPB Radio. He wanted to talk sports and during All Things Considered. So I'll be at Eventide in the 5 o'clock hour. I think I'm going to be the caboose, like they always do with the sports guy. Put him at the end of the show. 
And so we're going to be talking probably rapid fire sports, me, Peter B. Yellow, GPB radio and all things considered. So I'll be on at, uh, I'll be on like I think 550, I think is what they were saying. So uh, we'll see what happens. We'll wrap up the show and kind of take it off the rails and see what we can do with uh, all things considered in public radio. So uh, me at even tied with Peter Biello and all things considered later today. Uh, Prim and Proper coming up tomorrow on the network where we'll go over what happened in the week that was. Kind of go through the, the European uh, qualifiers and go through the, the matches of today and the matches, uh, getting you ready for the matches on the weekend. Uh, day one of two when it comes to this window. And tomorrow will be standard practice. Uh, if Michael Parkers joins us at 930 for our friends from Beyond Goals on the Friday free kick tomorrow, we'll talk about what it was like for him to uh, hammer the golden spike, wearing the Anton Walks jersey, all those kinds of things. 10 o'clock, we'll have a bit of a weekend whip around patent pending trademark coming sooner, hopefully, rather than later. And we will break everything down uh, in, in that regard. But uh, since it is past the uh, top of the hour, it's time to uh, read a promo, and I'm going to take the music down and not have it where it was when we were talking about Luis Diaz and VAR. But uh, find the right music and read a promo about our friends at Alumni Service. Oh, it'll be live on uh, GPP, GPP Radio. It'll be live, so it'll be on 88.5 locally in the Atlanta area with uh, Peter and all the commercials and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it'll be live. May uh, their Lord rest their soul. So we'll see what happens. For odor free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go, it's a lemonized service. Deodorizing in closed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos, they've created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pets, cigarettes, and food. Realtors and property managers use the lemonized service to eliminate bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. It's a turnkey process. Thank you, Ricky, for telling me what that is. It makes it easy to work with said realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment, we like that, because I know what that means. Offering a green way to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever, different than Febreze or our favorite masking agents that we have uh, either uh, above us in the cupboard or below the sink of choice. Because when you reach up into the cupboard or reach under the sink and you grab out that masking agent, you spray the masking agent in the air, there's a reason they call it a masking agent. It's because all it does is mask the odor. It does not attack the problem like our friends at Eliminize Service do with their proven scientific formula. Pricing very, very easy, either by the cubic foot or parts per million to come up with a price that's affordable for you on a daily basis as I've dropped my pen and I now can't find it, so I'm going to have to grab another one. Offering results in 24 hours or less. Any questions that you may have frequently asked or otherwise, you can go to the website, Eliminize.com, and this is where I grab my pen. This is why I covered up the QR code the beginning of the show because it's the qr code for the rest of the show i didn't want to get people with their qr code readers knocking two qr codes and knocking each other around qr code over my left shoulder for our friends at alumni service go to their website alumni.com but do us a favor after the dot com go slash atlanta so they know what part of the world that you are addressing them from so they can help you with your problems full homework assignment e-l-i-m-i-n-i-z-e.com slash atlanta alumni.com slash atlanta Lemonai Service, proud sponsors of everything SDH on your Thursday for your Thursday thoughts. And see, you get to like four or five and then it just it kind of just slams. So I wish there was like an actual fader on this thing. But uh, yeah, Lemonai Service, proud sponsors of everything SDH. And yeah, it'll be live, Hutch. So um, yeah, so 88.5 locally in the Atlanta area. With uh, Peter Biello, Peter will do all things considered. They'll do the national dropouts, and then they'll come back in. Peter will talk about stuff, and then they're bringing me in. I think it's at 550, and we'll talk about stuff. But, yeah, it'll be live. Even Tide Brewing and me talking sports on all things considered. So we'll see what happens. And uh, uh, for those of you that are locked into uh, high school football, all of the action actually starts tonight flag football at gpb and gpb.org the gpb sports app you got flag football tonight game of the week tomorrow is cartersville hosting hiram big region matchup 7 30 will be on the air once again on all the gpb platforms and then the rebroadcast will happen i think at 11 30 and so yeah we'll be up in cartersville tomorrow very very cool stuff 
from there as well. So, um, you know, we'll keep an eye on all of that. And I know that Bam dropped some ideas on uh, in the DMs. And so I've got to sit here and look at what the DMs are. And it was about the discussion with what Ange was saying and how he hoped things would be different when it came to the the world of uh, Australia and the women's sports and all of that. And uh, according to Optus, according to uh, BAM, when it comes to sport funding, Cycling gets fourteen and a half million Australian dollars. Athletics in general, track and field kinds of stuff, ten point seven. Hockey just under ten. Sailing nine and a half. Swimming almost nine and a half. Basketball eight, and football seven point nine million dollars. The Australian Sports Commission annual report twenty one twenty two, just under eight million dollars. Cycling getting almost twice that. Yikes. Cycling getting almost twice that number. Not, you know, that's not good for the future of the sport. But I know that if, uh, like I said, if Bart was in a position, he would be changing all that stuff all over the place. So very, very, uh, I mean, it's, it's concerning and disappointing, but not necessarily surprising when you have something like that. Uh, how many of you, how many of you have seen the Beckham series? Show of hands. How many of you have seen the Beckham series? I have not. Uh, by all accounts, Nick says it's very good. But uh, when you have folks look at it and they sit there and go, man, it's just kind of whitewashing over everything. It's, it's schmaltzy was the word that was used in, in one of the... Uh, one of the reviews of the series. I haven't seen it. I probably will at some point, but I have not seen it yet. And uh, I'm taking feedback as to what folks think about the series. If they take it at, at face value, if they're really diving in and sitting there saying, this is a fantastic interview. It's a great series. But when you kind of, and you see this recently with uh, with documentaries or docu-series, whatever you want to call them. He who's in charge of the production crew is in charge of the content. There are documentaries out there and docuseries out there that you sit there. They're not really the most deep diving things in the world. But once again, when the main character is the one who is spending all the money on the docuseries, and you're in control of the information and you're in control of the information platform, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of revelatory things. You know, with uh, the one clip that I do remember from the, the Beckham series is where Victoria is being interviewed and she's trying to downplay the automobile that she came in on one of their first dates. And... David Beckham opens a side door to the hotel room suite that they're in. And he's like, be honest, be honest. And she's still trying to slough it off. And eventually, after pushing and prodding, she reveals that she was driven by her father. Yes. Wiley, that was what her dad took her to school in. A Rolls Royce. She's trying to downplay that about the date. Took her to school in it. So, Wiley, what have you thought about the series? Have you seen it and how much have you seen and what do you think? But you get those kind of moments. You get that window that's open just uh, just open enough. Just saw that snippet. Okay, right there with you. So you get you get that bit of humor. But if Beckham is in charge of the production, you'll get the humor, but you won't get the serious stuff. I mean, I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you. 
that you're not going to get anything about like this that he said eight days ago publicly. Well, perhaps maybe if uh, you jack, you know, you tease something and then it just, you know. He said this eight days ago. Let me try this again. Take two. I go into, uh, whatever um, I go into within the business, we always do our homework on, on everything. You know, to be involved in another World Cup, for me, it was important. I've always said that football is a game uh, that should be shared around the world. This was an opportunity for another nation to get, you know, uh, for, for the Arab world to get a, a World Cup and uh, to host one of the biggest, if not the biggest, sport events in the world. Once we were there, we knew that there was going to be people that were going to either talk about it a little bit more or let the football do the talking. And I think it was a great tournament. A lot of people were happy there. No one came up to me. I had a lot of conversations with the LBGTQ co- uh, people when I was there, um, community when I was there, and they said they'd been treated perfectly fine. They'd enjoyed the games. Uh, they felt it was the safest World Cup that they'd had for, for a long time. Um, so no, I you know at the end of the day, you know it was a it was an important competition and one that I was proud to be part of. Uh huh. You ain't getting that in that documentary. You ain't getting that in the docu series by any stretch of the imagination. No, you are not. Nope. You ain't getting that. Not by any stretch of the imagination. You are not getting that. Uh, 18 players, once a uh, youth national team uh, out of the, the U.S., 18 players selected for the Pan Am Games playing Brazil, Honduras, and Colombia. Antonio Carrera from FC Dallas, uh, Shatura Odunzi from uh, uh, Charlotte FC, and uh, the, uh, the MLS Next Pro team, Reed Baker Whiting, Mauricio Cuevas, Nolan Norris, Nico Carrera from Holstein Kiel, Alexander Freeman. And Thomas Williams, both from the purple team. Midfielders, Javier Casas. We saw him with Chicago Fire. Ora Hell from Fire. Brooklyn Reigns from Houston Dynamo. Jack Paniotu, who we saw with New England Revolution 2 this season. Danny Leva from Rapids. Forwards up top. Vaughn Koval from Hull City. Tega Ecoba from Portland. Rodrigo Neri from Atletico Madrid's Academy. Jackson Hopkins and Ted Duquip. Ted Pietro. That one always gets me. That one always gets me. Always, always gets me. But that is what your your youth national team roster for the Pan Am Games looks like. And uh, Aaron Bupenza was called up for Gabon for an international friendly. There's a lot of stuff going on here today that's like little things. Uh, Spurs should rival Arsenal. The, the uh, discussion Spurs should rival Arsenal for Ivan Tony if they're serious about the Premier League title challenge. Of course, that's Gabby Agbon Lahore who says that. Nico Moreno joining us in about 15 minutes. But no, when you are in charge of the information, when, when you have the information and you are in charge of the production team, you ain't getting some quotes. You're getting some, but you ain't getting them all. So, yeah, just just keep that in mind. When it comes to information in and of itself, information in and of itself, who is in charge of the information, and what are you going to get out of it? That's what you're going to get. He who's in charge of the production crew and the pocketbook is in charge of the information. Just keep an eye on that. Just know that going forward. I think we have to be reminded of that sometimes. When you're, you know, and Harry Maguire, by the way, speaking of David Beckham, and this is the other side to the whole David Beckham thing. We mentioned Harry Maguire. He is uh, not happy, apparently, allegedly, possibly, probably, maybe when it comes to what's going on with his situation at Manchester United. But he rung up David Beckham to get some advice. And David Beckham apparently was very, very forthcoming, very, very honest. And they had a good, solid conversation about what to do going forward. Uh, 
So when you have David Beckham and you can sit there and call David Beckham and go, you know, uh, I've got a problem. I need your advice. When David Beckham can, you know, when you can call David Beckham and pick up the phone and sit there and say, um, can we talk? And you get that kind of uh, advice from a guy like David Beckham, you know, that's pretty cool. So it's a bit of a double edged sword sometimes when you're when you're looking at uh, getting the information that you need to continue to work forward. So uh, we mentioned Xabi Alonso and all of the other uh, news that's fit to print. Liverpool now is on red alert because of that uh, that, that uh, note in the contract. Rasmus Hoyland has put his full backing behind Marcus Rashford despite his Manchester United teammates' dreadful start to the season. FA has been told by the government it would be right to show support for victims of the terror attacks in Israel amid talks of over lighting up the Wembley Arch and the colors of the country flag. There's news on that in a bit. Uh, FA will announce plans later today to mark the recent atrocities at the friendly match between England and Australia after leading Jewish figures within the game urged them to act. Wayne Rooney said he plans to elevate Birmingham City to the next level. That better be the, that better be the Premier League because that's the only level up that you can go. Three and a half year deal. Sport England, which invests more than 300 million pounds of public money every year, intends to ask sports to do far more to fight the climate crisis as a condition of receiving funding. Daily Express, uh, Chelsea outcast Trevor Shalaba edging towards a January exit from Stamford Bridge, having failed to play a single competitive minute up to this point in the season. And the Blues could also bid farewell to Malang Saar and Mark Cucurella. West Ham first team coach Kevin Nolan has offered Eden Azard the opportunity to have a trial at the London side despite him announcing his retirement on Tuesday. Manchester United have identified two perfect, in quotation marks, defenders for Eric Ten Hag to sign in advance of next season, according to reports in Portugal. Steve Clark, according to the Daily Record, says Scotland do not want favors in their Euro 2024 pursuit as he tells his stars, let's do it ourselves. Celtic are reportedly keen on landing Guangzhou FC's Ho Yon Jung in January as the Scottish champs revisit the Korean market. And uh, Spain boss uh, Luis de la Fuente has warned Scotland they'll face a better and stronger side than they beat at Hampden in March. As talks continue... Over Michael Beale's successor, Rangers search for their 19th permanent manager, still ongoing with detailed behind-the-scenes discussions now taking place, but the club will not be rushed into naming a new boss. Job contender Kevin Muscat has left his current club's fans concerned he could be about to move on. He took charge of Yokohama Marinos in their 1-0 win over Urawa Red Diamonds on Wednesday, but supporters have been left fearing he was saying goodbye in the aftermath. Andrus Townsend has joined Luton Town on a short-term deal. One time at winger 32, he's played for Spurs, Newcastle, Crystal Palace, and Everton. He says he feels like it's a good fit. Last couple of weeks have been good for both parties. So Luton Town, they need all the help they can get putting the ball in the back of the net. Townsend says it's my local team, 20 to 25 minutes away, so I've kept my eye on their progress watching the championship playoff final. Seeing them win promotion was great for the club. David Raya is ahead of Aaron Ramsdale at Arsenal. Yes, it's just your 19th permanent manager. Uh, ahead of Ramsdale at Arsenal, despite nervy play against Man City, the stats show why Mikel Arteta wants him in goal. We'll go over that more on Prem and Proper tomorrow. Regan Poole admits he owes a lot to Manchester United after making his Wales debut on Wednesday. Destined for stardom in 2015 after leaving Newport for the Premier League club at the age of 17, the same day Manchester United made Anthony Martial football's most expensive teenager. So there's a story on him on Sky. Once again, keep an eye on Sergio Rossi. Had a hat trick in just 15 minutes. 13 goals so far this season. McGuire says he admits he will have to chat about things. Won't sit on Manchester United's bench and play once a month forever. Rangers manager search includes Philippe Clement and Kevin Muscat. We mentioned Kevin Muscat. Uh, coming up at the top of the hour, if you have Sky on a VPN, Wayne Rooney is going to be discussing what's going on uh, with him there. 
The Wembley Arch will not be lighted in the blue and white of the Israeli flag. The FA says that instead, England and Australia players will wear black armbands during their uh, friendly Friday night period of silence, also held before kickoff. The FA said it will, quote, remember the innocent victims of the devastating events in Israel and Palestine, end quote. Their statement continues, our thoughts are with them and their families and friends in England and Australia and with all the communities who are affected by this ongoing conflict. We stand for humanity and an end to the death, violence, fear, and suffering. Only flags and kits of competing nations, this is from Sky, will be allowed inside Wembley during England's match against Australia Friday in the Three Lions Clash against Italy on October 17. Over the years, the Wembley Arch has been illuminated in the colors of flags of countries, France, Turkey, Ukraine, within days of attacks. There are clear sensitivities with some wanting Palestinian deaths acknowledged. The president of the FA, Prince William, has commented on the situation in a joint statement with his wife through a Kensington Palace spokesperson. In part, it read, quote, as Israel exercises its right to self-defense, all Israelis and Palestinians will be continued to be stalked by grief, fear, and anger in the time to come. Health Secretary Steve Barclay had earlier joined calls for the Wembley Arch to be lighted up in blue and white, telling Sky we should make clear our strong support for Israel. We stand with Israel, and I think we've seen that with the parliament, We've seen it with number 10. I think it would be fitting to show that with Wembley as well. Premier League managers, players, match officials wearing black armbands and observing a moment of silence at the fixtures taking place from the 21st to the 23rd. So will clubs at EFL fixtures this weekend. So that is the latest from the FA about Wembley and uh, how things are moving forward there. So we'll keep an eye on on all of that and so that that is your that is your discussion from the uh fa side of things nine months before euro 2024 julian nagelsman is now in he was the natural candidate for the vacancy but philip Lahm is saying that nagelsman's getting paid too much hansi flick is said to have earned six and a half million euro a year Nagelsmann is setting to get uh, just under five to do the same job. The words from Philip Lom in a column at The Guardian. That's not good. That's too much money. You can't do anything about the economic dynamics at clubs that compete for the best players and coaches, but national associations such as the DF Bay should not be going along with these salary excesses. More than 2 million euro a year is not necessary. Starts with the fact that there are only about 10 or 15 international matches a year. At a top club, it's three to four times that. In between matches, a national coach is not on the pitch for four to six weeks at a time. The Day of Bay represents amateur clubs, the women's Bundesliga, refs, and a good 7 million members. It is responsible for organizing children's football and is in the process of modernizing its forms of competition. The Day of Bay's primary goal is to encourage young and old to exercise. It has a social educational mandate. As such, it's important to have men and women in positions there who think ahead, like Celia Sausage, the two-time Women's European Champ winner who last year was appointed the Day of Bay's VP for Equality and Diversity. It's an honor to serve the Day of Bay. Role models are required. But Lom thinks that yes, players that can earn between 10 and 20 million euro a year, it can't matter whether they they get the 100,000 euro in World Cup bonuses. Giving up the bonuses, national team players would be giving something back to the country that made their careers and wealth possible in the first place. It would also be easy for the day FBA, according to Lom, to create bonuses parity between the sexes, something that would immediately send a strong signal to society and would be fully deserved given the successes of Germany's women, which include getting to the final of the Euro in 2022. If everyone puts we above I, the chances are that the national team can and will achieve something great again. Lom's column was produced in partnership with Oliver Fritsch at Zeit Online, the German online mag. So Philip Lom thinks that you're getting paid entirely too much. Julian Nagelsmann's getting paid entirely too much. That 4.8 million euro. 4.8 million euro is entirely too much, according to 
uh, Philip Lom. Anfield Road, by the way, their upper tier is not going to open this year because of all of the uh, construction that's going on. So you won't see that, I believe. You will not see that in, uh, uh, in, in television at all. The Guardian also has a, an interactive on the next generation of talent. They go all the way back. It's those that were born in 2006, the 60 best young talents in world football. And looking at these uh, 06s, so basically you're talking about folks that are 17 years old. 17 years old is what you're staring at. All of the best 17-year-olds in the world. I mean, you're looking at high schoolers here, academy talent. Fidel Barajas is listed in this at The Guardian. If you have not seen Fidel Barajas play, you've got one more weekend in the regular season for USL Championship to do it. You've got one more to do it one more week but then they get into the playoffs if you haven't seen Fidel Barajas I think this is an opportunity for you to do so with what we've seen from Ben Pierman this year our friends at the USL show have uh, had the chance to see Fidel Barajas completely and totally all season long. And right now, Charleston, 5 o'clock Saturday afternoon. They get Birmingham Legion, and uh, it's the last week of the regular season. But once again, playoffs in the Eastern Conference. Charleston right now is third. They are locked into the third spot in the East. So Fidel Barajas is a part of this. The Guardians' next best 60 that Fidel Barajas is a part of. So that is your assignment on the weekend. If you have nothing else going on, check out Fidel Barajas as he plays against the Birmingham Legion. And the next time that the USL guys are on, which probably will be next Thursday, because it'll be the end of the regular season. We'll get into the playoffs. We'll discuss Fidel Barajas. Diego Koken, who is in the Barcelona Academy, is also U.S. born. Cruz Medina for the San Jose Earthquakes is a part of this as well. So three names that have ties to uh, what you're having with uh, the United States. Either playing here, born here, three names in the 60. Fidel Barajas, Cruz Medina, Diego Koken. So that is your... uh, So that might be a homework assignment later on on the board. Just posted the list. Michael Head with a question for today. I've often thought about what national team coaches do when they don't have the players. Seriously, what do they do other than watch film and visit some club matches? It's a good question. What do they do? I I think a lot of it has to do with PR. You've got to sit there and, uh, you know, you've got to shake hands. You've got to do the public appearances. You've got to do the car wash. You've got to do the TV. And you're you're looking at film. You're probably going to a lot of different matches. You're probably spending time going point to point to point to point to point, checking on the talent pool that is squared away. I know, Rich, it's a new font. I was shocked. Rich, new font for quotes. Yeah. It's an updated, an updated uh, software package. And, but yeah, literally it's, you're going to a lot of different matches. You're, you're scouting. It's whether it's video or it's in person. And I think legitimately you are spending a lot of time in airports and hotels as a national team coach, Uh, airports, hotels, you know, visiting camps, those kinds of things. And to Bart's point, be surprised how much scouting they're doing. Yeah, Michael had a great gig for a few million bucks. It is, except when you don't win. 
It's a great gig, except when you don't win. Rich missed four days of the show, and everything changes. Yeah, uh, everything. Everybody's locked into uh, the Phillies and the Braves right now, Bart. I mean, uh, and Rich. But yeah, everybody's locked into the Braves right now, and uh, I don't know if it's necessarily panic, but it's like you know you got to win too. <laughs> Uh, that's what golden parachutes are for. Exactly. Hutch. You, you don't do well. You're out the door, except maybe in Canada where uh, Canada soccer isn't paying a whole lot, a whole lot to anybody to do a whole lot of anything. Um, but yeah, right now it, it's Phillies and Braves and all of the, uh, the other activity that's going on. But once again, reminder today, you get your Saba update at noon. With Georgia and Thailand at noon. And keep an eye on all of that. 2024 qualifying at 245. Argentina, Paraguay at 8. Brazil, Venezuela at 830. A lot of activity on the uh, college side, both men's and women's on the plus. A lot of women's games today. State and Southern played last night in the rain in Statesboro on the women's side in the fun belt. And Southern came away with a 2-1 win. World Cup qualifying, we got to get into Conma Ball. We'll get into that and then uh, CONCACAF Nations League. We haven't gotten into that yet. And uh, so plenty to, to get into for the uh, remainder of the program. But since we do have a half hour left, and it is a Thursday, I have to knock out the new font. And we get to ask this guy, what cup of coffee is he on? So what cup of coffee are you on, Nico? What's going on, John? This is my second cup. I'm running around, obviously trying to get to your show. I was like, man, I got to be ready. Uh I got this SDH audience that's going to be listening to the show. I got to be on my best. So, yeah, second cup of coffee. Nice and dark, this one. It's like gasoline right now. Wow. I mean, but but I will give you full credit. You are dripping in the silver and black Sonics logo. I mean, that that's strong up top. I will I will give you that, sir. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, you know, we got a NBA season's coming up and uh you know, you got to rep the city. So we we got it on just for SDH. Well, and I see now we got to get you cracking gear. If you're gonna, if you're going to support your your local Sonics, you got to start repping the Kraken, man, because they're back at it too. I do. I I got to get a little more into hockey, man. I got I got to tell you, I've, uh, I, I'm really trying, learning more about the game, uh, going to uh, Climate Plants Arena. It's it's really cool watching a a, a hockey game, but I got to learn the game, man, because it's it's it's. It's cool. I can follow it, but I just got to learn a little more about the rules and things like that. All right. So where do you want to start? You want to start with the uh, the Conma ball activity, or do you want to work our way from Major League Soccer coming into the break week and then go into Conma ball tonight? Um, we, we can talk about Conma ball if you want. Uh, just um, before we start talking to some MLS chatter. Mm-hmm. So. When you look at, and I don't think a lot of folks may necessarily understand just how crazy and cutthroat Conma Ball is. I mean, every game means something, and everyone's in a pile, and you got to be on your best every single match. When you, when someone is interested in looking at Conma Ball qualifiers for the first time, World Cup qualifiers, and they're diving into the deep end of this pool, how would you break down? what this World Cup qualifying cycle is traditionally for South American football? Well, that's a very good question, especially because uh, traditionally and today kind of has changed because of the number of uh, spots that are going to be given to the World Cup. I used to believe that it was the hardest qualifier in the planet that has the toughest soccer, that has the the, the biggest names in, in general senses. Um, but because of the new format, I feel like it's lost a little bit of that difficulty to get 
to the World Cup. And, you know, even when I watch Colombia these days, I'm like, well, they're, they're not playing great. But I'm like, well, considering that there is as many spots as there are now, they'll probably be okay. But uh, what I would tell someone that maybe hasn't watched Comic Ball in the past, I would say it's physical. It's all about home field advantage, no matter where you are. Uh, Bolivia has a chance to win any game because they take teams all the way to the top of the mountain and uh, you got to play in uh, elevation and you're going to be out of oxygen and you got the crowd. Colombia's going to play you like they're going to play Uruguay today in Barranquilla in the oven, you know, 3.30 uh, with the sun beaming in your head, just trying to cook you alive. Argentina will take you uh, down to a stadium where, where the crowd feels like they're in your face. So everyone has a little bit of an advantage um, and you get to see some of the best prospects. You get to see some of the best players in the planet. Th that I have no doubt in my mind. Uh, whenever you go back and think about World Cups all the way down to the 80s and the 70s, I mean, some of the time that you've had in uh, South America and Common Ball is it, it, some of the best. Uh, it's played at a different field. It's played at a different level. Um, and in today's day and age, I feel like the gap has really shortened in between the what I would call the second tier national teams uh, and those third tier national teams and uh, i'm talking about ecuador's getting so much better uh, venezuela's closing in on the gap uh paraguay we just got a new coach and you know they're trying to figure things out but i feel like because of that the competition level has increased a whole lot you look at the standings currently no surprise after the first two match days brazil and argentina up top they both got six points colombia right now winning a draw they're at four and it was a, a goalless draw with, uh, with uh, Chile last month. Uruguay in their first two matches, three points, a win and a loss. Same for Venezuela. And Uruguay is ahead on goal difference. Paraguay, Peru, Chile, all at one point. Then, you know, but like I said, this is way early. And then you look at Ecuador and Bolivia. Bolivia right now, after their first two matches, it has been blowout city. Losing 5-1 to Brazil and 3-0 to Argentina. At least you got the two tough ones out of the way. And Ecuador, on a federation decision, had a three-point deduction to start things out. So they're having to fight uphill even after a win in their last match against Uruguay. I mean, it could get this legitimately. It, it, it's fun for the neutral but if you are hip deep in this, I mean, man, it, it, it is you are biting your nails and you are screaming your head off the entire time. I mean, it's a fun one. It, it really is, man. And uh, honestly, uh, Uruguay is a must watch these days with Bielsa ahead of that uh, institution of that team. They're such a dynamic, intense team. They run for days, and that's why today's soccer, uh, today's game against uh, Colombia is going to be very interesting. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but yes, that that last game against Ecuador, I feel like Uruguay should have probably tied that game. There were a couple of, of missed calls by the referee. Uh, but give credit to Ecuador, man. Ecuador, um, I, I don't want to call them a dark horse because I think that they've earned the the title of being above that. Uh, they have so much young talent. They have a, almost a golden generation coming up here, uh, you know, with Caicedo uh, and uh, the, the way that some of their young center backs have been playing. I love Stupid John. Uh, you know, he's a guy that just has gained and grown so much so quickly within the last four years. Um, so I think that this Ecuador team can be problems for any team here in South America. but. Uruguay, in their own way, man, they, they just seem to be a very fun team. They finally have that generational change that people have been waiting for, um, leading by a guy like Nunez that I love to watch him play. He just has to be more of a finisher. If Nunez can start to finish, half of the chances that he creates, that's going to be a tough team to beat. No doubt about it. Jared Smith joining us for a Thursdays with Nico. We're talking we were talking Conma ball. We're going to get into Major League Soccer and, and the international window. Jared, what is on your mind with Nico this morning as we kind of just go a Thursday free for all? 
Yeah, honestly, I'm just enjoying the combo ball discussion because it's one that we have a lot, even when Nico's not here about. Uh, I, I long to make like Belgium play a game at La Paz. <laughs> <laughs> or I long to make England go play a game in Chile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, or, or I mean, in, in even the same sense of like, let's let's mix up Champions League. Well, let's mix up Champions Leagues one day because oh, oh. as much as like teams in Western Europe complain about having to go to Eastern Europe for a Champions League match, I don't know, man. Let's uh, let's send some, let's send like Borussia Dortmund to go play a game in like, I don't know, Matagua. <laughs> Go make them play on basically that carpet from 1997. Oh, that would be just see what the hell happens. That'd be fantastic because, as we all know, La Paz is not sea level, and no, it's uh, not. and that would be the fun part. I mean, that would be Nico. I think that uh, a lot of folks that are tied to European football may not necessarily quite understand that it's a different it's a different dog when you're talking Conma ball. So, I mean, it's 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 a bit of a wake up call for these kinds of folks. I think. It is, and I've had discussions uh, with some of the, I guess, purists of the European soccer, and they actually criticized the fact that a team needs to take a, a team and play them at altitude in order to beat them. And what I say is like, man, home field advantage is what it's about. I mean, you, you play a, what, I guess you could call it two legged or whatever. You you play away and you play at home, and you got to make it count, man. So uh, I'm all for you using the elements, you using your habitat, your atmosphere, whatever it is that you want to take part and making it your fortress. And then it's up to the visiting team to figure out, hey, man, well, you know, we're going to be playing. Uh, today uh, in Barranquilla with humidity and and with the heat. So guess what? We're going to have to change our game. It's all part of the, the tactics, the strategy, what goes into being a, a coach. So I, I love it. I, I think it's interesting. And you've seen team obviously go to uh, Ecuador, go to Bolivia and, and take games. So it's not like it's impossible. You just got to have the talent, have the will, have a plan, and it all comes through. But, but I think that it balances things out, right? Because if you're going – one-on-one against between Bolivia and Brazil is going to be a tough game for Bolivia, right? But if it's at home and I can manage things certain ways, then it just kind of equalizes things. Yeah, uh, we'll get into our Major League Soccer discussions. It is, uh, mm-hmm. for the most part, it is a, a week of off week in international play. But you got some folks that have some makeup matches. So we will play red light, yellow light, green light for the week that was and kind of go into juice boxes a little bit for the weekend that will be. So, Jarrett, you're on notice that you've got to come up with your red light yellow. I already have them. Okay. Uh, all right. So then, Bobby, if Jarrett's already got his red, yellow, and greens, Nico, I will let you start. What direction do you want to go for red light, yellow light, green light in Major League Soccer? All right. Well, um, <laughs> let's, go, let's, let's go red light. Let's all go right. red light because um, – I got to talk about a team that uh, we've talked about in the past that uh, obviously is eliminated from MLS playoffs, uh, but that has a rough road ahead. uh, And that is the LA Galaxy. And the way I'm going to start this is by saying that the LA Galaxy is a historic club that has all these accolades that follow it. And they're in a really tough position. Your neighbor next door has turned you into the LA Clippers of the MLS. Wow. And they've stolen not just the success, but the lights of Hollywood. They've stolen the price of merchandise. You uh, you walk around LA and you see LAFC everything. People wearing LAFC gear. There's LAFC murals. And LA Galaxy have turned to the little stepbrother that just nobody wants to look at and it's really been difficult for this team to not just win a game but to have a little bit of a platform to show what they got right so this 5-2 game against minnesota where you allow pookie to score a poker Wow. You look out of sorts. Yoshida's out of place. Uh, uh, th- there is no balance between your fullbacks. Uh, uh, 
Reynoso is having all the time in the world to find spaces uh, in between lines or behind the, the, the back line that just was a mess. So the LA Galaxy have had a swing and a miss on DPs for a very long time. Structurally, the issue has been the front office. They have gotten rid of some of those cancers. Uh, Will Kuntz has come in and um, I think helped out because if you look at some of the recent moves, especially to bring in MLS talent, they've been they've been decent, right? You bring in Fagundes, you bring in um, uh, the Colombian dude. Um, man, I forget. Uh, I, I can't believe his name. Ex Dallas, ex Colorado Rapids. Um, anyways, you bring out you bring in some MLS players that that, that are going to help you out. Yoshida was a, a good signing. Uh, Baby Shark, Sharp. Uh, really did wonders for this squad. You know, you bring him on a free. Um, and all of these things, I, I think, tell you that there is a new manager that is willing to bring in players that can provide a specific assignment. So to conclude, the red of this LA Galaxy is not just for this season. That has been atrocious. That They were the team that gave up the most goals in the league. That uh, just... Yes, there were injuries. There were a, a lot of injuries to players that you brought in that were going to be game changers. But at the end of the day, the LA Galaxy are running out of patience, out of credit. And I don't really know how quickly they're going to be able to change that. And if Greg Benny really is the guy, because after two years, I see absolutely nothing. So that's why I put him in the right category. Jarrett, your red light is whom? Uh, right now, going into... Going into the end of this season, into the next season, right now it's Austin. Okay, for me, um, I, I know that I know that Josh Wolf just got the dreaded vote of confidence. He did from new leadership. He did, but man, like it, we and we talked about the SC the other day, Nico, that this is a team that they showed you a couple fun moments in their first year. Second year was insane. This year, not so much. Feels like year four is a which one are you? kind of kind of set up coming for him and i feel like that leash might be really short and they got a lot of questions to answer i mean yeah like you got a guy who was in the mvp conversation last year you've got some guys who are out of contract and a chance to kind of remake some of this but with new leadership in town i have no idea what this is gonna look like for austin i just know that they floated around the yellow light all year long and then just to crash at the end like they did and just it it, it start it was an it was a season long thing. You know, they go they go lose to Violette early in the season in international play and just continuously step on every rake possible. I imagine the leash is gonna be insanely short. If they had not given in the vote of confidence, Josh Wolf would have been my next one probably on the list of managers who needed to be looking over their shoulder. No doubt. Yellow light, Nico. Whom? All right. I'm going to try to stay. I was going to talk Red Bulls, but because I, I get brought in to talk about the West, um, yes, I'm going to talk about, about whoever you want, man. Well, you, talk you, about you, you go East. <laughs> you go East. We're good. Whoever no, no, want, no. I'm going to I, I'm gonna talk about San Jose. Like I said, Red Bulls is a team that's definitely on the oh, yellow. It's I Jarrett, cannot... Jarrett's Quakes get the yellow light. That's fine. No, he's right. Let's go. I, I, I can't believe San Jose, though. Uh, they're in the yellow, but they're trending towards red, and they got to show me that they're a yellow team. They got to show me against Austin that they deserve to be in these playoffs, and that goes as a challenge to Lucci, who I believe is a fantastic coach that I think if he gets to the playoffs, the results would ultimately make this a successful season, especially because of what he kind of came on to. But this is a talented team with some very good players. Uh, Love what Trouco has done this season. I like the Hopi move. Uh, Espinosa, although outstanding most of the season, like we've talked about a couple of uh, episodes ago, those wheels are starting to run off. So where is he at right now? Can you get him all tuned up, greased up, oiled up, rotated tires, and get him ready for the playoffs? Perhaps they have to do that against Austin. Austin has been terrible like uh, uh jared just said and and rightfully so so now san jose you show me that you have 
uh, Ibobusi in, in good form. You show me that uh, Carlos uh, Grasso is going to be the guy that's going to be the leader in that midfield. You show me that Trauco can be the international guy that you brought in to be and uh, provide you with and uh, a double function from the left back position. Show me that, San Jose, and you can remain a yellow. But if you go and put up a stinker against Austin, you're going to be dropped down the red. Man, Jarrett, you're yellow light. Uh, first off, I agree with Nico as as the resident San Jose sicko. Um, <laughs> look, and, and Jason and I talked about this early in the season. Like at first, I thought San Jose was just going to be a weird good team. Like they have the, all the potential to be a decently good team, and I agree. Like which is a really good coach, and they it, even though this year hasn't gone the way they wanted it to. I, I feel like they're in a more stable direction than they've been in the past. Now it is on them to continue that stability in a positive direction. And no one's going to do that for them. That is completely on them to do, but it's different than when Matias Almeida was managing that club where it, it felt weird and fun. Now it feels like something you could build that could be stable going forward. Um, as far as the yellow light goes, I'm actually going to, I'm going to bring it back east to a team that's actually in the playoffs. And it's this, the playoffs is going to be a show me thing for Nashville. Um, I spend a lot of time breaking out a cat of nine tails over Nashville's back. Um, and I'm going to continue to do it because they're in a situation now as a team where they have two games left. They can try and make this interesting, get up to the sixth spot if they want to, but everything is so damn dependent on Heidi Mukhtar to a more extreme degree than I remember seeing in the last five plus years of this league, more so than I think Atlanta was with Joseph. Like it, it is so dependent on Hani Mukhtar and Sam Surridge hasn't been able to stay healthy and hasn't gotten you what you wanted from him when he came into the summer window. If they have another playoff showing where it's, you know, first round or second round and you're out, I think you got to look real hard about remaking large chunks of that roster. Because it's it when when they're when they go through those runs in the middle of the summer where they'll win like five in a row, it's really fun. Hani Mukhtar is an absolute artist in transition, but it's gotten to the point with Nashville. I feel like the ceiling is limited, and I don't know how high they can push it without making changes. And they still have not reached as high as they got in year one in 2020, which was a weird year for everybody. Nashville's fine, but I feel like you, you can't settle for fine. Fine. You can't settle for fine. So no, that, 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 that's right on, man. And I think just nice and short, th their inability to just be dominant at Giannis Park, I think it's been – big on only eight games one at home this season now what we're used to seeing from nashville uh defensively they stayed strong uh but sam surge who started off pretty good turned off pretty quickly so can he bring it back up because that was what we were asking of this nashville team and initially me and john thought we may be swung in the miss by saying that sam wasn't the guy because he started off pretty good but maybe he's making us look like geniuses because he really turned off <laughs> They 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 poured all the damn chips into that uh, into that cup run and more power to them. They they took Miami to the wire, but man, it's yeah it hasn't yeah hasn't been able to stay on the field and the guys they've got that also playing that attack have not been the same kind of guys. So then green light Nico is whom? Uh, man, green light, it's uh, difficult because there's a lot of good teams on both ends of the of the conference, and I, I refuse to continue to go with the LAFC narrative because I already gave them enough props for the day. Um, <laughs> and, and I know that you guys don't want to hear it, but I'm starting to see a team that started off we, we've, we've talked about them and they, they might have been my green light team la last week mm -hmm. but they're starting to look like a playoff team that is no long no longer a contender but now they could be my favorite to get out of the east and it's going to be the purple team okay um, yes. i think that that win three two against uh the revolution 
was a statement win, and, 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 and bear with me. I know that New England is a team that I put in the yellow category, that I'm not as high as I was, or as, I, as others are on New England for obvious reasons. But this 3-2 was a little bit um, not what the score tells the story of the 90 minutes. Uh, Galese had a couple of unusual mistakes in this one. I mean, there's a shot that he could easily have stopped and he goes right through him. I'm not really sure what happened there. But the ability to, to control tempo, uh, the ability to um, close down space in the midfield, uh, the way they push that back line and find um, players in between lines uh, because of a guy like Johnson, whose long passing abilities has been amazing. Facundo Torres finally coming to be the guy that we were waiting for him to be. Uh, maybe in his last season in MLS, finally going to do that. Oscar Pereja is a guy that has a lot of holes in his game when it comes to the playoffs. I, I, I think if there's something that Oscar hasn't done, he's been really good in the playoffs. So that might be something that we might hold him to. to. But in terms of talent, in terms of coming into a playoff game and being able to do either be pragmatic, hold teams back, play the counter, uh, really go and find a game when you need a goal. They have the ability to do all of it. And, and the gambit of tactical changes that Oscar can do within a game make me believe that this Orlando team is the front runner to take the East. Green light, Jared, who is it? Well, now I got to find a different one because it's going to be my green light. Because um, I've, I've been screaming that for a couple of weeks, man. It's of the teams in the East, Orlando is the one that scares me the most. Um, mm. Like my Philadelphia hasn't consistently finished games this year. Columbus can't finish games in the last ten minutes. Um, the hell, they lost a game to Orlando a couple of weeks ago, in which they gave up two late goals to Orlando. Goals to Orlando, then gave up the goal to Atlanta this week. I, my argument with Columbus is still they are fun. Well, for Nazi's an amazing coach. They can't close games out. What happens? You get into a playoff game and you can't close it out. You can't close it in 90 minutes. And then you got to start gearing up for another 120 minutes after you've made your subs. Um, yeah. Orlando is very much, uh, very much, very much in that category. So if I got to go with someone else, um, you know, give me, um, I guess one of the obvious ones, but give me St. Louis in the fact that 56 points, yeah first year in the league and i'll tell you then 56 points would put you right now in third place in the east but that's fine because they're not in the east and if frogs had wings they wouldn't bump their ass when they jump so the ifs and buts of st louis don't really matter here because what they did is they played what was in front of them they played it to 56 points and they played it to winning their conference and the thing that i think impressed me the most is i kept waiting for them to have like a longer lull in their schedule than they actually did. Like, yeah, they went through a couple of stretches where, you know, they struggled with a couple of results. I thought it would be more pronounced than it was, even with some of the injuries they had. I'm in infinitely impressed with what they put together in year one. Can they replicate it in year two? I don't know, man, but we'll cross that bridge in December and January getting into next year. But I want to make sure that you know, and I know they'll get their flowers from everybody for, for winning the conference, but like for not having that lull, considering how they play and how often we see teams that play like that go through those stretches, the fact that they were able to minimize it and be pragmatic at times. I think the, I think the staff and everybody there deserve their flowers two, three times over for what they did. A couple of matchups. Yep. Yeah, a couple of matchups this weekend. FC Dallas, Colorado. We've got Colorado news coming up in a sec. Nashville hosting New England and LAG hosting RSL. A lot of decided favorites. FC Dallas, big favorite at a minus 227. Nashville at Geotis is a minus 127. Shooter McGavin not happy with Clint PA. He calls, <laughs> Clint, calls him Clint PA pants. And then LAG and RSL, about even. The, right now they're both at about one plus 148. Draws at a plus 300. Before you go, Nico, uh, a lot of folks here on the show, whether it was, you know, one of us or Twitch Pitch, was wondering about how long it would take for Colorado to work the Cronky 
uh, line of, of franchises to, to bring in folks into the conversation. David Ornstein from The Athletic about 15 minutes ago. The Rapids are considering appointing Jack Wilshire as their new head coach. The 31-year-old has been coach of Arsenal's U18 team since July of 22 and has made a strong impression, leading them to the 22-23 FA Youth Cup final in his first season in charge. U.S. franchise made a formal approach to Arsenal. I don't know why you would make a formal approach to, to <laughs> Arsenal to talk to somebody who's within your own family. But formal approach to Arsenal to speak with Wilshire, who has thought to have impressed in his interview. Wilshire's keen to move into senior management if and when the right opportunity arises. So David Ornstein is reporting that Jack Wilshire, Arsenal's U18 coach, is in consideration for the vacant or the soon to be vacant Colorado Rapids gig after the end of the season and Chris Little and his interimness are sent on their way. Uh, I think that's a big move. Uh, I think that you have to make a you, you have to make a decision and I, i'm not gonna criticize that one uh if you're hoping to change the dynamic and bring in a guy that maybe is gonna change the profile change the style change the scheme change the tactics maybe help out with that academy system maybe help develop some players and sure uh, i i'm not gonna sit here and uh criticize them for going above what they have uh look all respect to uh chris little and i'm sure that he is is a fine coach and uh, probably in a different situation they might have allowed him to at least get some work done but the desperation of colorado is getting away from being the worst team in mls and and, and not just a bad team in terms of losing games but just unwatchable it's almost unwatchable and it's, and it's been a long time even with frazier we used to say well you know it's well structured the discipline da, 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 but it's still been boring and, and, and he was and he was a good coach mls is changing and you gotta evolve with mls and because of that i i think it's the right move however he's got to come in with hopefully the idea of saying hey get me a gm that's going to allow me to do x y and z i gotta bring a certain amount of guys because this roster ain't gonna cut it this roster for colorado is not gonna cut it and that's where you have to start so i'm guessing a guy that has that arsenal mentality that maybe is going to come in with a different type of thought process can provide that for colorado and that's going to be helpful all right jared we have held up the, the fourth has held up the the light board we've we've added minutes here uh, about damn time that Colorado went sideways and was looking at Cronky Sports and Entertainment and other places. Jack Wilshire, this is interesting. It is. Um, it, it's also the fact that, yeah, I mean, since Inigo's point, like Colorado's just been bad and boring. <laughs> yes, they have. And just like rudderless, man. They're just kind of sitting out in a lake and they don't have an oar. They're just kind of floating around. And there's no tide to take him anywhere. There's, I mean, Jason's going to come out of the water and reach into the boat and grab the, the camp counselor. That's where we are. I mean, that, dude, that feels like a blessing right now. Like, feels like the sweet release of death would be a blessing for them. But, <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it, it's the thing of if you can bring in somebody in to do this, cool. Um it's like we we talked about for a while. It's like I said, I brought up Jesse Marsh's name for a job like this. Somebody who could come in, work within a bud, work within a budget, who has a system that you could work from the academy level on up. Because man, this is yeah, this isn't like a flipping a house, man. This is like we're you you need to take Colorado down to the studs and rebuild it, and you need to take time to do it. And there's like it feels like you know we have the we have like the idea of proof of concept in year zero. Dude, we might be in like year negative two with this team because it's just so damn tragic. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. Yeah. But I, I think that if St. Louis taught us anything is that even if you have a, a limited budget and you bring in a guy, right, that you can follow behind and you bring him the tools that he needs to create a specific system to win games, then you could be successful, right? So maybe that's the way or the route they're trying to go. And and, and you keep 
certain guys, right? Cole Bassett and maybe Navarro, maybe Rubio you keep, whatever it is that, 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 that he decides to do. Or you just rip it all out, like, like Jerry just mentioned. Just blow it up, figure it out. You're not losing anything. You're not going to get any worse. Best thing about being at the bottom of the river is that you can only come up. So there you go. Rich Ransom, the favorite line in the story from uh... – the, the athletic rapids 96 approached arsenal and permission was granted to talk she was dark <laughs> through the whole thing nico what's going on with uh, pulso sports and with the soccer bar uh soccer bar uh will be interesting uh we will be starting here in about 40 minutes uh we're gonna talk obviously mls players playing common ball mls players playing uh within the u.s national team and uh, uh mexico and all everything international that are coming up uh we're gonna talk about the Mount Rushmore of MLS uh, as we approach, I believe, the birthday or anniversary of uh, Mount Rushmore. I got that email from production last night and I was trying to figure it out. So that's going to be interesting. And uh, in Pulso Sports, we're going to go down to uh, Starfire today, talk to some of the players, I have something in the works that is going to be out on on, on Monday, uh, but it's going to be an excellent one-on-one -on -one that might turn some heads so stay tuned for that uh maybe we'll talk about it next thursday and uh yeah it, it, that, that's about it looking forward to it so uh for nico for Jarrett, who went back to the real world and for me uh thanks for hanging out with us here on another round of thursday here at sdh we'll be back at it again 905 tomorrow morning hopefully visit from our friend at beyond goals mentoring if it's michael parkhurst we'll talk about driving the golden spike and wearing the anton walks jersey a couple of matches in Major League Soccer, we'll get into that in the almost weekend whip around. Plenty of stuff to talk about for Nico, for Jared. I'm John. Played safe, everybody. Since it's the end of the show, that means we get to do this. Back at it again at 9.05 tomorrow morning.